It is Monday, December 18th, 2017. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And all my Virgilings, are you impressed with yourselves yet? Are you terribly impressed with yourselves yet? You most certainly should be. If you aren't, you must. You most certainly should be, especially if you have some Verge currently in your wallet. You should be looking in the mirror and saying, you are the smartest motherfucker on planet Earth. You impress me so much that everybody else is just a dim flicker by comparison to you when it comes to investing and picking the right coin to invest in. That's what should be happening right now. And if it's not, you're probably in the same position I am. Oh my God, why did I sell so fucking early? (laughs) But hey man, it's crypto life. Crypto life. There are no guarantees. Today's turd could be tomorrow's gold and we just don't know. But you know, we can follow our intuition and whatnot and still come up a little bit short. That is what happened to me. Oh well, I'm not gonna cry. Uh, I think that uh, I think that we have a very bright future ahead of us, and so of course I I reestablished my position because you know I, I see I see a lot of good things ahead for Verge, and uh, I, I think especially now with some of the uh, stuff that we're going to be covering today, or at least one article that we're going to be covering today, I I see that my my uh, trust and faith that authoritarians would be trying to crouch down on us even harder during our most successful times uh, that I chose to get into backing Verge because I know that in the sh- in the not so distant future we're going to have people that are trying to hide their money and hide their transactive activity and that's not a crime you know what? That's if you if you can't have privacy over how you choose to allocate your funds, what the fuck do you have? What 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 possibility do you have to ever challenge the status quo if you have some authoritarian watching over where you put your money and maybe creating situations to where you don't necessarily make the money that you would have made without their control over what's going on in the. Uh, in the greater market at large, and I, I was having an interesting discussion with this uh, with a friend of mine today about this, where I think that all of the education that people go through to actually get to a trading desk um, for for a big company or whatever, I think that that kills a lot of their their intuition for for potential good buys. And they end up falling into the status quo and maintenance of the status quo. And before you know it, all of the the high-fluting dreams that drove them to Wall Street and drove them in pursuit of funds, those those all went away. Those all went away with just the idea of maintaining one's wealth rather than building it on spurious and, and completely disparate opportunities that a lot of people are looking at and turning their noses up up at you know and and all of you who uh, who held on to virgin and, and uh, had it on through this weekend you guys are visionaries either that or you're just really fucking lucky one of the two we're not going to debate about it we're not going to we're not going to you know talk down about you for having been there at the right time Hey man, we need successes to tell us what we're doing right, especially when we've been facing a lot of failures and learning all about where we've been wrong. And so it is with that, I would like to say that it was a a very productive Get Your Ass Kicked at Jiu-Jitsu Monday. Um, I actually didn't get my ass kicked as hard as I was anticipating, but I still got I still got pretty handled. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't really I didn't really make a real threat of myself. Um, if anything, I was playing defense the whole fucking time. <laughs> but you know, I can admit that you know I, I don't have so big an ego about my my jujitsu prowess that I can't look at what I did today and just realize that. I was just staying alive the whole fucking time.
<laughs> and it's with that I want to go ahead and throw down into some music um, and as far as what to put down for our first dance I have no idea I have not picked it but some old school anthrax is definitely feeling in order so let's go with that who cares wins off of state of euphoria here on coin metal And that was Punch in the Face by Ministry. And don't we all need a punch in the face sometimes? I think I got mine today in a couple ways, actually. I, uh, <laughs> for one, my stupidity in trading, man. I, I proved to myself today that I'm like the absolute worst trader in the entirety of crypto. And I'm not going to lie. But, you know, <laughs> whatever. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not broke, but you know, I'm not like rich like a lot of you fuckers got today. Shit. But you know, what what are you gonna do? It, it just wasn't my day. I've had a day or two th- this month that I was very very happy with and very very proud of my performance on, and but t- today wasn't one of those days. <laughs> I mean, you know, you'd think that uh, as bullish as everything has been, that I'd have learned, but no. No. What are you going to do? Like I said, you can only uh, you can only look at the stupidity of the past and try to avoid it in the future. That's all you really can do. With that in mind, I, I think that's one of the, the drivers behind, like, what I what I try to point out on this show is that we've we've been through a lot of the same problems that we are experiencing now in crypto one of the biggest mistakes that's been made at these junctures is that people like you and me abandon our responsibility in the whole scheme of things and opt to hand it off to a higher authority and then we bitch about the way that authority uses that position the position that we put them in by refusing to compete with them and then we seek a higher authority to deal with them and so we try to like elect one to to tax them harder or some shit like that but that's the cycle of events that's happened with shit uh fuel at one point in the early 1900s we had electric cars can you imagine that as over a century ago there were electric cars here in the united states never mind that they did they've done everything possible to scrub that reality from every single book every single testimony of history but it was true it existed if you go back to the early 1900s movies they depict a world running on electricity and it's because at that time their world did run on electricity you know we were in this this i want to i keep wanting to call it like a diaspora event but i'm not sure that 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 word kind of kind of describes it entirely like where we're having this proliferation of expression right and rather than trusting in the market in the way that things actually pan out rather than trusting that as the process by which we deem you know this is good this is bad we can live with this we can't live with that this risk is too high that risk is good we establish these these metrics through the performance of the market and right now we're doing that with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies but we're coming up to a juncture now <clears throat> where some are looking at, at what's going on here and they are saying to themselves these people have too much control of their own destiny we need to rein them in and so now we have the CBOE and we have the CME and we have other people's trading trading futures. But you know what? The fact of the matter is there's been fucking futures trading in Bitcoin for years. For fucking years. 
My only assurance with regard to cryptocurrency is that there are enough projects out there and this stuff can be done completely on the down low. I mean, in ways that if you were really looking, you would not be able to tell what's going on. As far as you know, somebody's just looking up a web page or some shit like that. It just, it all looks the same to you. And all the technology to make that possible is already here, and a great deal of it is being utilized in Verge. <laughs> hence, hence one of the reasons I am with Verge, and I do believe in the coin as much as I do. Because I see a time in the not-so-distant future where they are going to be looking. And they're going to be coming to you or sending you notifications and saying, Hey, dude, uh, we noticed that all of the commerce that you're doing doesn't have any value-added tax being accrued at any point throughout it. And we're hurting for funds, and so we want you to give us your fucking money now. And there's not going to be enough cops. There's not going to be enough drones. There's not going to be enough anything to stop the people from saying no. And I think that we're on the juncture point. We're, you know, we've been deferring to higher and higher levels of authority this entire time. And what it's led to is where we're at right now. Where the biggest moving... <clears throat> the, the vehicles, I should say, for moving value from one person to another with as little friction and as little regulatory pressure as possible is happening. And I, I envision a future not so distant from now. And I, I did I, I responded in a uh, <clears throat> a tweet about this, but I envision a future in the not so not so far from now where we're going to be taking old hardware and we're going to be repurposing it and establishing networks with our neighbors. Whether they be wireless, whether they be wired, with our direct neighbors. And we'll probably be going straight to wireless because that's possible. But the point being that <clears throat> one of the biggest problems with what we're facing right now with regard to net neutrality and shit is that back in the early 90s, the, mi the mid 90s, we deferred this authority over how we should run our networks and shit over to the federal government. And the, and the FCC has ran, ran around writing fucking regulations on, on scratch paper and shit as they, they deem something else that needs to be regulated. And the only people that can play that game are people that are coming into the game with billions of fucking dollars to make sure that everything is compliant. And more importantly that they're funding the, the people that are establishing the regulations so that they can just they can adjust the regulations until nobody else can compete with them. Well, I'm sorry, we can't go into the 21st century with a fucking noose around our necks. Only so much air is going to get to the brain, only so much blood is going to get to the brain, only so much food is going to get to the body, we, we can't do it. It's not going to be possible. And, and more importantly, we won't do it. I don't envision a time when we won't be able to do what we're doing right now in cryptocurrencies. I envision that as regulatory pressures adjust, that more and more decentralized systems will develop. And you know, Bitcoin didn't become what it is today overnight. It's been rolling for 24-7 for the last eight years. Running. Working on nine. <clears throat> Point being that it's been up this whole time. And that, that's, that's more than can be said for a lot of other systems. And I, I think that the 24-hour cycle, you know, we, we talk about how fast things move in cryptocurrencies and how, how fast value adjusts in cryptocurrencies. 
this is because new voices come in, and, and when they come in, their their influence disrupts every every normal trend that happened beforehand, and it's because they have a lot of money, and you know, so they're they're wanting to put it in the in certain places to make the maximum yield, right? And there, there's nothing wrong with that, but it creates dynamism where we take money from them and they take money from us. And they may even have insider knowledge and whatnot. But when we put our, our buy, in, buy orders and our sell orders in, they fucking go through. It, you know, if the, if the price ever hits to where, where we're at, they go through. There's not, there's not some special magic by which when you put your order in, it doesn't execute. I mean, if you're far enough ahead of the ahead of the uh, seam, which you should be, don't pay retail. Uh, he, you should be you should be hitting it, you know, without without having to be right on the line. I mean, sometimes you do that, but I mean, I don't. I I I do everything possible to avoid buying retail. It's just that's just the way I operate. You know, so I, I make I make my decisions on what to trade pff, days days in advance, and my biggest problem is that I want to sit there and actually you know execute some fucking trades, but the things that I'm seeing they're not in the time interval that my expectation is, in. <laughs> so you know I end up panicking, and you know. And 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 jumping too sh- jumping too short, you know, and second guessing myself, and you can't do that in, in in trading, you know. It's like I just I I determined before I went to ju- jujitsu today. It's like okay, I am micromanaging. I'm probably making the fucking exchange rich on on trade fees. I no, not gonna do it. Not gonna do it anymore because this is not the the way that I got to where I am with it. As pitiful as it's been, I've still gotten somewhere. Point being that I think I can go further with what I've been doing, and you know, big whip de do. I don't, I don't make every fucking penny possible. I don't fucking care. I'm not trading on the millisecond here. I see a trend. I have expectations. It will either hit them or I will be proven wrong. One or the other. You know, as long as the trade doesn't expire, that's all I care about. That my trade is still in the books when it finally gets to where I think it's going to go. And like I said, you know, I, I know I miss out on opportunities, but I'm not going for millisecond trades. I'm not even going for minute trades. I'm not going for hour trades. I'm going for trades that I see two, maybe three days in advance, maybe even a week. But a lot of times, I you know, I see the action in between when I check back on it, and I'm like, "Oh man, I want to get in on that," and you know, and that's when I end up fucking up. But like I said, if the 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 times when I've been most successful with my trades is when I've had absolute undying faith. That the trades that I established before, that they will go through. It's an eventuality. It's going to fucking happen. I just have to hold on to my guns. I have to refuse logging into my fucking account until it gets to where I think it's got to go. You know, and, and again, that's that's what you got to do. Yeah, and and you're not a feeling kind of thing. Like you're looking at the raw material, the raw the raw information that you have in front of you. You make a judgment, and you fucking stick with it. I mean, now of course, there's going to be times when you just it's obvious you were completely fucking wrong, and you need to readjust before you lose your ass completely. And and hey, you got to do it. But again, if you have some faith in what you're what you're doing. A lot of times you will, you will miss that. You know, I mean, I I've made some adjustments in the last month or so that that were were profitable for me, and I was breaking with what I had originally saw. But it was because what I my vision was a little bit too far down the line. And the fact of the matter is, is if I would have left everything alone, 
I actually would have hit what I thought I was going to hit. It just took a lot longer than I thought it was going to take. So, you know, whether that whether you can count that as being quote unquote right, I don't know. But it felt right to me. You know, I made money on it and and, and that's what you trade for, right? Is to make money and to support projects that you believe in. Actually, that's why you invest, not why you trade. You trade to make money. You invest because you believe in a project and you see legs on it that are going to fucking take you and it well into the horizon. And that's that's where I see Verge going. You know, this is this is creeping up on us. This idea of trying to regulate us and trying to govern us and we've already seen where this has not been effective you look to china they had this big fucking scare with their ico thing where you know that you can't trade on fucking icos and you can't you know, we're going to close down the exchanges and and all this bullshit right there was some tightening some people were closed down the the exchanges that were able to meet the regulatory burden have stayed open as few as they are but the point being is the Chinese are still fucking trading did the mining escape China? no, not entirely not yet, but they will I I think in the not so distant future, we are going to see Venezuela really breaking free from the rest of the world economy they are going to be a producing nation, a major producing exporting nation in the next decade do not fool yourself that is happening the the foundations for it are being established right now and we're already seeing that the government control of it is going to be minimal if at all existent you know they're looking at that twenty thousand dollar fucking bitcoin and they're saying to themselves, why? Why would we try and put this in a cage when it is benefiting us so much more with the way it's being, with the way it exists right now? You know, I, I read this article, and <clears throat> if you go back to my YouTube channel, I, I did an episode called uh, Venezuela Leading the the digital current uh, the uh, like world world digital economy into the 21st century and i was covering articles about venezuela and how the mining has has really taken taken hold there that we're seeing the um we're seeing the miners not only enriching themselves from mining but they were buying products using uh I think it was Amazon or Amazon Prime or some shit like that in neighboring neighboring countries and, and like stuff to live on, you know, groceries and shit like that and clothes. They'd have it sent to an address in like Bolivia and they go to Bolivia and pick it up and bring it on back in. You know, or I, I think they could probably ship it from Bolivia, but point being that they were supplying themselves with everyday necessity items utilizing the funds that they were generating from mining can you imagine this can you imagine that in the United States where we have so much more money and uh, the the people here are, are a bit richer by comparison to the average person in Venezuela but the the point being that I'm going at with Venezuela is that they're already experiencing it in such a different way that I believe they are going to be providing a model for a lot of South and Central American governments to just basically just hands the fuck off. Let it, let it just run wild. Let it, you know, don't, don't worry about what China's doing. Don't worry about what America's doing. And this is the advantage here is that you can be in America and have a friend there in Venezuela and you could be doing transfers with this friend without anybody else knowing there are ways to do that 
<laughs> but it, with that aside, now now imagine that you can ship the funds to a jurisdiction without any regulatory burden, without any taxation burden, or be receiving it from them. There are going to be autonomous zones everywhere, and they're not going to be geographic. They're going to be digital, and you're going to be interacting with people all over planet Earth via these autonomous zones. And I believe we are going to displace so much monetary value in our own transacting that whatever idea people had about using this technology as a command and control of the entire world economy, which it, it certainly can morph into, that they will just find themselves one day where the electricity for their part of the grid is just like reutilized because the, the AI and the smart contracts that are running the electric grid determine that the economic output for their area of the planet versus the amount of electricity and, and input is, that's being delivered there is so minimal in actuality, in actual productive good, that their, their resources are just repurposed. You know, they go to the office and the lights just don't turn on. They can't get their computers to work there because it doesn't have any network. <laughs> that's the future I see. Where just one day the government doesn't have enough electricity because the 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 grid itself is repurposed at the smart grid that they touted all this time for is like, dude, all right, let's see. We're putting eight thousand gigawatts into this block and we're getting about we're getting negative digits of actual economic output for that much effort being utilized there. Now we could repurpose that to <laughs> this this project in Kentucky and we can establish more more grid capacity by, you know, putting in a wind farm or a geothermal plant or something. That's that's the kind of future I see is the money when given the opportunity to be completely unchained and be utilized almost exclusive, exclusively to what we imagine wanting to live in rather than what we, what we have nightmares of trying to live in, like, like 1984, using that as a goddamn roadmap. You know, what, <laughs> is it really so much fun? Is it? <laughs> I mean, to to try and you know torture somebody Guantanamo style via via various tweaks and, and manipulations to saying that you're you're holding up five fingers when you're only holding up four is that so much fun that you're willing to abandon the possibilities ahead of us? I I, I can't find anything that I, I would deem more disappointing for us to do with this kind of technology is using it as some sort of yoke to put over the entirety of man. It saddens me, the idea of that. And what saddens me more is that there, there are certain people out there attempting to do exactly that, or at least in my imaginings there are. I mean, because it's like, you got a fucking magic wand, right? <laughs> you can do anything with the fucking magic wand, but we're going to build prisons with it. <laughs> we're we're going to do uh, social nightmarish campaigns and fucking drive people on guilt and caffeine. Yeah, you should feel guilty for being an organism and having sexual drives and desires. And wants to improve your life. You should feel guilty for that, bastard. <laughs> anyway, I saw this this article here, and I had to repost it on Twitter, and it said, "Fucking crypto, uh, fucking Bitcoin traders." <laughs> and uh, here it is. This is on um, 
where is it? Um, the slate dot, or the, um, slate dot com. You're not imagining it. The internet is really slow right now. And this is by April Glasser, right. and uh, no picture, so I'm just going to say no penis. And it's funny because the the map indicates these hot spots, and I'm sure it's a video, but I'm not going to play it right now. Um, and all the hot spots are places where are, are cryptocurrency hotbeds. <laughs> I mean, Colorado's got this big orange splotch in the middle of it, about where the springs are. You know, Texas has got this big old red spot on it, and uh, what is it? Uh, Alabama, I guess. I don't know. One of those states is, is pretty hot, and then then Florida's kind of yellow, like. The majority of the state is kind of yellow, except for the end, which is like, like reddish. It looks like an infected penis of some sort. And then when you go up the the eastern seaboard, right, and you get up to the top towards New York and shit, it's all red, man. It's like somebody came along with a spray can and just went, <laughs> you know. And then they went over here to Los Angeles and San Francisco shit, and they just like they took the the same can and just. <laughs> And it's got this big red spot, and it it like encircles the entire area from from, uh, from all the way around uh, San Francisco, San Jose, all that shit, right? And then down below that, in in like Hollywood and in Diego, San Diego, and just another big red spot, right? These are all hotbeds for you fucking crypto traders. I know it. I know it. And the same thing with Portland and Washington the, again big crypto hotbeds and so uh <laughs> i'm not surprised at all if it would be due to you guys but uh let's go ahead with this article here with what the text actually has to say about this to explain everyone has a sluggish monday sometimes this week it's the turn of what feels like the what feels oh, you jackass sorry april you, you you killed me here it's feels not fees let's start over again everyone has a sluggish monday sometimes this week it's the turn of the what feels like the entire internet right now two major backbone internet service providers L3 and Cogent appear to be suffering from a from massive outages and downgraded service according to the ISP monitoring service Down Detector which collects and analyzes network status reports to determine early interruptions. And scale scroll scroll according to the according to Down Detector's outage maps Internet users in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, Dallas, Atlanta, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. are being hit the hardest. Comcast also appears to be suffering outages, though they're less severe than those hitting Cogent and L3, or Level 3 rather. Backbone Internet service providers work directly with large internet platforms like Netflix to deliver large amounts of data across networks and also work behind the scenes of consumer-facing ISPs. Since the internet is an interconnected mesh of wires, disruptions with Level 3 and Cogent could impact service for Comcast and Verizon users in turn. Slate reached out to Level 3 and Cogent to ask if they've determined the cause of the disruptions. The internet is a network of networks, and slowdowns can happen all the time for any number of reasons. These could be regular vanilla network maintenance problems. More worryingly, it could be the side effect of a massive botnet, like the Mirai botnet that was identified last October when hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of internet connected devices sent junk traffic to Dyne, a major domain name service provider, to cause severe outages across the internet. 
Sometimes outages are the result of disputes over peering, a term used to describe connections between websites and internet service providers that <coughs> pardon me, that determine how they exchange traffic so that data can be carried from one part of the internet to another. Pairing depends on pacts between internet companies, but sometimes these companies don't always get along. Take what happened in 2010 between Comcast and Netflix. Comcast said that Netflix's high bandwidth video traffic demanded more from Level, level 3's network than what they had originally agreed to, and for the first time, Comcast refused to upgrade its networks to handle networks incre and Netflix increased traffic until they struck a new deal. Even worse, in 2008, a peering dispute between Cogent and Sprint became so bad that the two companies stopped exchanging traffic entirely, and the internet was momentarily um, portioned to the point where different parts of the internet couldn't communicate with one another. But since this time, the outages are happening with host Cogent and Level 3, a peering dispute is unlikely the culprit here. Hmm. Scroll, scroll, scroll. This slowdown is also a reminder of what kind of internet we may well have once the new Federal Communications Commission rules axing network neutrality protections hit the books. They'll allow internet providers to legally block or throttle access to websites and are slated to go into effect as early as January 2018. The current outages are probably not a case of your ISP behaving badly, but come next year, that very well may, that very well may, could be the case. Yeah, that should be maybe the case, not could be. Anyway, uh, yeah, <clears throat> this whole scaremongering over net neutrality, um, I'm, I'm not impressed, honestly, because imagine it like this, okay, you're getting a service from somebody, and that service starts to suck, and it sucks badly, right? What are you going to start doing? What are you going to start doing? Are you, are you going to sit there and take it? Or are you going to say, God damn it, no matter where I go with this fucking cell phone, I cannot get a connection. I'm going to... You're going to start looking at competitors or for competitors. And if you can't find one, you're going to start looking for really, really fucking smart people that know how to do this shit, and you're going to say to them, hey, if we can get up enough money, will you help us design a network so that we can get off of this bullshit and we can start communicating with the rest of the fucking internet again without these fucking assholes? That's what you're going to fucking do. Because that's what always happens. It always happens. Necessity is the mother of invention. Go ahead, Comcast. Abuse your position. Make it suck. There are enough internet fucking engineers out there, people that are capable of designing hardware, people that know how to route shit, that are working for fucking minimum wage fucking burger flipping because they were so indebted by the time they they bombed out of fucking college that they couldn't afford to live to leave the town that they'd been doing college in and they still have that fucking debt but you know what when you present them with an opportunity you know they go to their their linux user group meeting you know or some shit like that and somebody says to them, hey you know networks right you you know how to set up a broadcast tower right why, why don't we try and set up like a white space network or some shit like that let, let, let's let's kick kick some of this traffic that is just going between us off of the internet and that that way we can we can experience our our own network without the lag of everybody else on it and then of course later on 
you'll find out that you, you've expanded your user base enough and, and your nodes, nodes are distributed well enough that you can actually conduct commerce via these means. And you know, it's not going to be too much longer before you would establish enough network space where you would actually be able to develop your own economies and your own currencies now that we've got Bitcoin. Can you see where I'm going with this? Go ahead, Comcast. Abuse us. Go ahead, Verizon. Abuse us. Go ahead, AT&T. Abuse the fuck out of us. Abuse your market position. Charge us outrageous rates. Throttle every fucking packet across your network. I don't give a fuck. You will hasten your demise. You fucking people that want to whine about this shit, quit whining. Start reading up on network architectures. Start figuring a way out of this shit. You want to kill this shit? Don't ask Big Brother to fucking control Verizon and all those guys. Don't make Big Brother try and make them play fair. Try to displace your dependency on them. They are your bottleneck. They are keeping you from flying your own fucking vehicle to work. Fuck them. God damn. Let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. And I'm, I'm all jacked up, so we need some Metallica here. Damage Incorporated here on Coin Metal. Thankfully, that one had a long outro, and that was uh, Meshuggah with internal evidence. Every once in a while, I like to let the let the machine pick one, and uh, it surprises us every once in a while. And that was that was the machine's choice. That was actually off of uh, off Contradictions Collapse slash None. And if you want like the the raw essence of Meshuggah, like the the real business. Um, I don't know if there's any different songs on Psychic Test Build. Um, that's I, I think there are actually copies of that available somewhere. Somebody has a copy of it that they're willing to sell you. Anyway, um, I don't know if that one has any different songs on it. I believe it does have a different singer. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but as far as Contradictions Collapse is concerned... I heard this album back in like the early 90s and I'd it, it was either from a guy who was a really big fan of the band but I actually think he was he was a member of the band and he was here scoping shit out and I I couldn't tell you exactly who he was whether he was one or the other but point being he was a musician he was associated some way or another with Meshuggah he brought contradictions collapsed to the u.s in the early 90s and i listened to it and or just little snippets off of it and i i'm like you know i just i don't see it really really taking off in u.s markets i mean because we were just making the transition from like slaughter and and la guns and white snake and white lion and all that other bullshit to grunge at that time and so I really didn't feel like the metal world was ready for that shit. And, and in all honesty, I still think that, that most of metal is not ready for Contradictions Collapse. I mean, I know that sounds weird because that was basically their first commercial release. Um, well, second, if you want to count Psychic Test Build. Um, but that was their first major release. And I think that was on Nuclear Blast. I, I don't want to speak out of school but i'm pretty sure that they've had uh they've had nuclear nuclear blast as their their distributor this whole time but anyway uh yeah like i said if you want like the raw essence of meshuggah you really need to listen to that album because like everything that they they're doing now is either an extrapolation of what they were doing then or this was like the fundament for what they're doing now. You know what I mean? Like they they took what they did then and then they ex 
they like change the time of it or something like that or they they like built on top of that as as a fundament a base layer you know and uh I, I think that a lot of other bands look back on it and say god damn i wish i could make an album like that um it, it, it's not as approachable as some of their later stuff. I mean, when you when you go and you listen to uh, "Destroy a Race and Prove," um, that album it was it was so lean and so concentrated and and so just absolutely like in your face that you know it's, it was just completely inescapable, man. I mean, it's like. But with with contradictions collapse, they hadn't quite refined it, and I I think when they did the EP none, that's that's when they kind of really figured it out. And um, the uh, version I've got of contradictions collapse is contradictions collapse slash none, and you get a real taste of their evolution with with like ritual. And a few of the other songs that were were like the latest or the last ones in the in the album, uh, it's it's a slightly different feel. It's more refined, you know. It's like they got touring for contradictions, contradictions collapse, and then they they had ideas that were incubating that they decided to try out on stage, and you know eventually took back and recorded. I don't know, but the point being that where they were going from that point forward is I think what what brings us to the Meshuggah we have today you know I, I mean that's that's logical saying it now because you know we're here 20 something years later but what I mean by that is that they didn't get off of the path you know you can look at any any one of their albums and you can find some of the essence of that album in every single one of them you know, even even up to the the latest one, the uh, uh, violent sleep of reason or something like that. Um, yeah, that there are some there's some root elements that if you're really listening to it and you're a uh, you're a Meshuga fan of the Elk I am, you, you can hear it. You can hear that that essence traveling through all of their music. Anywho. Let's get on back into articles. <sighs> I've got a few here that I wanted to touch on. And this net neutrality business, we've already addressed that. We've already considered the options, and honestly, I think what I've stated is the best way out. We've got to eliminate the dependencies. Cut the leash. Start establishing our own fucking network infrastructure that is completely separate and completely independent of it. You know, we've already done it with the money, and that's the biggest one right there. We start establishing our own networks. That's that's the roads to a future society, you know? It's not it's not a uh, terrestrial life that we're going to be living. As a matter of fact, I've, I, I've taken to uh, referring to paper money as TP, terrestrial paper. <laughs> Anyway, uh, this is one of the things I was referring to earlier when I was talking about Verge and and where I see the uh, the utility of it really really making itself obvious in in the uh, the months and years to come. Anyway, this one's on Fortune.com. Bitcoin might soon face tougher regulations in Europe. And uh, this is by Bloomberg. What? Let's check this really quick. See if we can get a direct link. I, I like actually giving the the attribution to the person that wrote it, not the publication that posted it for them. No, 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 not venture capital, not Hershey, billion popcorn, become ah. There we go. The ledger. Here we go. Doing our due diligence, hunting it down. This is on Fortune.com, or it's referring me back to that. Jesus Christ, that's not what I was trying to do. Damn you! 
trying to get to fucking Bloomberg's original article so I can find the appropriate attribution to give here. It gives me quotes from the damn thing. <laughs> That's terrible. All right, fuck it. We'll read it from these douchebags at Fortune with without the proper attribution. Wait a minute, maybe... No, no, that's not it. Okay, so this is by Bloomberg, December 18th, 2017. European governments are pushing for Bitcoin regulation as alarm grows that the world's most popular digital currency is being used by money launderers, drug traffickers, and terrorists. French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire said he will ask his counterparts in the group of 20 nations whose presidency falls to Argentina next year to consider joint regulation of Bitcoin. His concerns are shared by the Italian government, which would be open to discussing regulation, according to a government official in Rome who asked not to be named, since the move is not yet policy. The UK is also backing European Union moves to bring in new rules that would apply to Bitcoin. I don't like it. It can hide activities such as drug trafficking and terrorism, Lemire said on LCI television, adding that he also had concerns for savers. There is an obvious speculative risk. We need to look at it. Study it, he said. Lemaire's proposal came as Bitcoin took another step forward toward acceptability with the launch of futures trading Sunday night at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group venue. That's a week after Chicago rival CBOE Global Markets introduced similar derivatives on the volatile cryptocurrency that was created in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis as an alternative to banks and government-issued currencies. Bitcoin was closing in on a fresh record of $20,000 on Monday. Actually, we've hit it several times on different markets. France is not alone in seeking to regulate a currency which is stepping further into the mainstream financial world. Italian finance, finance minister Pier Carlo Padone would be ready to discuss Le Maire's proposal according to the official in Rome, who said that the ministry had yet to receive any request from Paris. Not likely to happen. The EU is working on new rules for cryptocurrencies. Stephen Barclay, economic secretary for the British Treasury, told lawmakers on November 3rd the government is negotiating with EU partners to, quote, bring virtual currency exchange platforms and custodian wallet providers into anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist <laughs> financing regulation. The firm's activities would be overseen by national authorities, Barclays said, adding he expected the talks uh, to conclude at European, level, European Union level this year or in early 2018. For the British government, digital currencies, quote, can be used to enable and facilitate cybercrime. According to a note from the Treasury, there is little current evidence of them being used to launder money, though this risk is expected to grow, the Treasury said. Quote, that is why these regulations will help. No, they won't. Two Nobel economics laureates denounced Bitcoin last month. Joseph Stiglitz said it should be outlawed and doesn't deserve, quote, any socially useful function. Robert J. Schiller said the attraction of the currency was a narrative akin to a mystery movie that draws in people who want to outsmart the system. <sighs> yes, well, I don't know. I, I think that, um, I think these people are silly, honestly. Um, y you have no further to look than China. You have no further to look in uh, than China to see how this shit plays out. The ICO markets, they got the hammer down from, from the uh, Central Bank of, of China. 
you know, the, the public the PBOC. And um, <laughs> what happened? Did the trading stop? No. A lot of the, a lot of the good law-abiding citizens chilled out for a little bit, but they didn't stop. They didn't stop at all. They probably left long-term trades in and just stepped away from the trading table for a little bit. But the fact of the matter is, we don't know. And one of the reasons we don't know is because of over-the-counter trading, which has been very, very popular there in China. And this is something that I think a lot of these guys are missing, is that Bitcoin isn't the only cryptocurrency. And because it's not, and you've got ICOs and all that other shit in the background that these people trade in, you're not going to put a stranglehold on it. I mean, I, I downloaded a Coinami wallet the other day, right? On most markets, on many markets, I'm inhibited in how I can invest in ICOs, if at all. Okay? And this, this inhibits my ability to express my will financially but coinami in the wallet itself i can buy fucking ico tokens in the wallet itself and that's not the only app that allows you to do that you want to tell me you're going to stop that shit you're not going to stop shit you're going to look at it and you're going to get angry. That's what you're going to do. That's all you're going to do. You're going to look at it and you're going to get angry and you're going to say, I'm not getting any of that money. And that's right. You're not getting any of that money because you never had a right to it. We didn't have a choice but to pay it to you before. You aren't producing enough quality for the quantity you are getting. I mean... You know, people look at the, this last election as as just the presidents. You know, what what they they look at it as as Hillary or or Bernie versus Trump, and that's not what it was at all. It was a mindset, and, and like it or not, Trump expressed more of the mindset that is necessary for living in the twenty first century than Hillary did, or Bernie. Both Hillary and Bernie were, we are going to tax the rich, and we are going to extort the rich, and we are going to take everything that they've got so that we can give it to other fucking people that didn't do jack shit. Now, you know, you, you've, you've rented an apartment, right? You know, you, you've, you've paid the rent on a monthly basis. Every once in a while, and you've probably experienced this, a friend... You know, somebody you knew, they needed a place to stay for a little bit. But they weren't able to pay rent. They, but you were, out of the, the goodness of your heart, willing to let them couch surf for a night, maybe two. And before you know it, your, uh, your temporary live-in person has become semi-permanent. And you're having difficulty getting rid of them. And they're eating your food out of your refrigerator and sucking up your electricity and occupying your television. Is this somebody that you want to keep around? Are you doing them any real favor by doing what you're doing? You know the answer to that. So now why would you think that on a society level, we've got to do the same thing? Not only that, we're not going to make it optional for you to let the couch surfer stay. We're going to make it obligatory for the couch surfer to stay. We're going to make it obligatory for you to feed him, for the light to be on over his head, for the electricity to stay on. We're going to make that an obligation for you. You can't get out of it. That's what's being said to you with taxation, is I know how to spend your money better than you do. I know what to invest your money in better than you do. My values are more important than yours. And I, as your representative, will spend your money on things that are in my interest. 
And if you question the fact that that mentality pervades over our, our ruling parties, I mean, really, look up one of your representatives. You will find out that they have got several commercial interests that they are entertaining in Washington. And they are very, very nice to these people because, hey, you know what? They're friends. They're helping them make money. You like you like people that help you make money, right? Well, they do too. And those people have a hell of a lot more than you do. But we're changing that. <laughs> Cryptocurrency is kind of resurfacing that. And, and some people see that as a threat because... They're looking at the meal on their, their plate and they're saying, you know, this might be the last one I get out of this because I'm not sure that the tax structure that's feeding me is going to be here next year. And that, that frightens them. And they should be frightened. If, they're, if what they're doing isn't providing enough value to everybody else around them, then really, why should they be doing it? You got you to gotta, you gotta put that to the test, you know? Anyway, I got this other article here and... Uh, you know what? It was just so clickbaity. I, I had to go with it. Um, <laughs> and this is on Fortune.com. I'm assuming it's on Fortune.com. It might be. Oh no, it's from Bloomberg, of course. And uh, this one was actually written on December fifteenth. And I, I want to address this one because I think it. I think I know what it is, but I'm not entirely sure. So I'm, I want to go for it. So the the title of it here is Bitcoin has a dirty, dirty secret. Gotta wonder what it is, right? And this is by Bloomberg, December 15th, 2017. Bitcoin has a dirty secret. The cryptocurrency has wowed markets this year with breakneck gains as investors flocked to an asset that exists only in cyberspace bullshit. But the laboratory, uh, the laborious creation of each digital Bitcoin by private computer networks has real-world consequences in the form of massive energy use, including from fuels that cause the most pollution. Eight 100-meter-long metal warehouses in northern China are a case in point. Bitmain Technologies runs a server farm in Erdos, Inner Mongolia, with about 25,000 computers dedicated to solving the encrypted calculations that generated each Bitcoin. The entire operation runs on electricity produced with coal, as do a growing number of cryptocurrency mines popping up in China. The global industry's power use already equal 3 million U.S. homes, toppling the individual consumption of 159 countries, according to Digiconomist Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index. As more Bitcoin is created, the difficulty rate of token generating calculation increases, as does the need for electricity. This has become a dirty thing to produce, said Christopher Chapman, a London-based analyst at Citigroup. Energy has always been part of Bitcoin's DNA. The person credited with creating the currency, identified only as Satoshi Nakamoto, devised the system that awards virtual currencies for solving complex puzzles and uses an encrypted digital ledger to track all the work and every transaction. As the market grew from a hobbyist culture in 2009 to a global phenomenon this year, ever more computing power was needed by large networks. Bitcoin prices have surged more than 2,000% in the past year on some exchanges and touched a record of more than $17,800 on Friday. CBOE Global Markets began offering Bitcoin futures on December 11th, reaching $18,850 on the first day of trading. There are other cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum and Litecoin, but Bitcoin is by far the largest. China, which gets about 60% of its electricity from coal, is the biggest operator of computer miners and probably accounts for about a quarter of all the power used to create cryptocurrencies according to a study of the industry published in April by Garrick Heilman and Mike Rauchs, 
Hey, Rouks? Rouches? Rouches? Rouks. At Cambridge University. About 58% of the world's large cryptocurrency mining pools were located in China, followed by the U.S. at 16%, the researchers said. China is the biggest producer and consumer of coal, and server farms in provinces such as Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, and Heilongjian my apologies, are heavily reliant upon the fuel. Expanding demand. Estimates of how much electricity goes into making cryptocurrencies vary widely, from the output of one large nuclear reactor to the consumption of the entire population of Denmark. But analysts agree that the industry's power use is expanding rapidly, especially after a price rally that made Bitcoin almost four times more valuable than just three months ago. Total electricity use in Bitcoin mining has increased by 30% in the past month, according to Alex DeVries, a 28-year-old blockchain analyst for accounting firm PwC. Quote, the energy consumption is insane, said DeVries, who stated the Digiconomist blog to show the I'm sorry, who started the Digiconomist blog to show the potential pitfalls in cryptocurrency. If we start using this on a global scale, it will kill the planet. No, it won't. Some analysts dismiss such claims as overly alarmist, noting that even the high-end estimates of demand account for only about 0.1% of what the world uses. Advances in technology may also make operations more energy efficient. Still, it's getting more expensive to produce cryptocurrency as the energy use of the process rises. Miners, especially the big ones, will look for cheaper power to better weather price volatility, according to the Cambridge study. Electricity costs in China, which has surplus capacity of coal, coal-fired coal -fired generators, and vast reserves of the fuel, is well below what consumers pay in the U.S. or Europe. Yep. And now let me tell you why this is complete and utter bullshit. And there, there's a little bit of panic fud that we might follow on that. But uh, yeah, this is why it's complete bullshit. <laughs> Let's take a, a, a trip back in time. Okay, it used to be, if you, if you were to look at the uh, network metrics back in, say... Uh, 2012 and you were to compare them to now energy efficiency wise you would find out the overall efficiency of mining per unit per unit mining has actually increased over time and I would say probably 60-70% over, over what we were uh, maybe even higher Point being that we went from CPUs to GPUs to FPGA to, to ASICs. Now, why everybody assumes that this, this development cycle is going to stop with ASICs is beyond me. As a matter of fact, I believe that we are on the threshold of a return to a majority of mining being done via GPUs. And let me explain myself here. Already we're seeing that there are video cards out there that are starting to catch up efficiency-wise to ASIC miners. Now imagine, you know, maybe maybe a year in the future. We're already talking about right now. Okay, we're already talking about NVIDIA and um, I think it's AMD are both working on headless cards. Whether or not they've actually got them in production right now, I don't know. I've had I haven't been following it that closely, but headless cards. These are cards that are not designed to be used as video cards for gaming at all. They are designed to be mining cards, specifically designed for mining. Now I've made a lot of product predictions on how this is going to play out, and all I can tell you is. 
that if it is going to go the way that I think it's going to go, this is the start of it. This is going to start an arms race in mining that we have not seen yet. We have not seen it yet. And you know what? We are going to save the fucking planet through our rapacious greed. Yeah. Yeah. You think greed is bad? You think it's bad? Greed is why you've got the fucking iPhone 8. That's why you got greed. I mean, the, 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 greed is why you've got that. N nothing else brought that to your hand but fucking greed. And, and if, you, if you're living in some fantasy world where that isn't true, you, you need to disabuse yourself. You, you need to let go of that. that. That thing that's in your hand, it's more powerful than fucking server farms back in like 1990. I mean, if you were to take a, a big ass fucking server farm in 1990, that fucking device that you've got in your hand is more powerful, has more access, can do more shit than that server farm could have. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we, we use it to fucking chat with one another on Twitter and messaging apps and shit like that, but it's fucking powerful. You can repurpose it to do all kinds of shit. As a matter of fact, Samsung has has a, a project that they're repurposing their, their old S3s, S4s. They've got a development site that you can go to and learn about it. I don't know how well fleshed out they have that, but <clears throat> consider that probably right now you could probably buy an S3 for what you could buy a really nice... Uh, Raspberry Pi for the specs on it will be the same. The capabilities will be way more with the with the S3, and, and just imagine the kind of things that you could be doing with it. You could use it for like a remote control for your your uh, I don't know your HVAC in your house or something like that, or you know water purification or you know, a, a wide variety of applications that you could be utilizing it for. Mining, perhaps. I think that one of the trends we are going to see is people reusing old hardware to launch smaller coins. I think we're going to see that bursting out again. And it's because there's a demand for it. Smaller, faster coins, like Verge. But I mean, I, I think that, that we'll, I, we've actually... We're, we are positioned properly for the niche, the, the use cases for for privacy coins and such. But the point I'm trying to get to with this is that the the way that we need to keep Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is to where we are the suppliers of the coins. We cannot hand this responsibility off to big-ass mining farms. And it's the same thing with the Internet. We are suffering right now because back in the early 90s, Somebody let some asshole with a big ass megaphone lull us into some some state of mind where we believed that the entirety of the internet, aside from what we could actually view from our, our desktop at work, was nothing but a bunch of fucking pedophiles and drug dealers. And and we, we had to we had to put an end to child porn and, and weird shit like that. And that's how we got talked into that net neutrality bullshit. And this whole idea that we still need to maintain that, it's the worst case of fucking Stockholm Syndrome I've ever seen. You've been made to love your abuser, and you, you don't even th think to displace them. Oh, we gotta keep him in power. He's keeping us nice and safe. Yeah, he's got you paying 150 bucks a fucking month for internet access, too. For a service that should be costing you about 10 bucks a month. And you should be reutilizing that $140 a month to investments into yourself and your own business and your own ideas. But no, you're paying it to Comcast because, well, you think you deserve to get raped monthly. I don't know. Like I said, worst case of fucking Stockholm Syndrome I have ever seen. And, and it might just be that the rest of the regulatory morass is such that even without net neutrality, the, the entry bar is too high. And you know what? I think that Bitcoin's example is probably the best one to follow in this case, where 
We just simply didn't ask for permission. We didn't say, is it okay if we do this? Is it okay, Master, if we... No, we just said, you know what? This seems like a good idea. Let's launch that shit and see what happens. And here we are, nine years later, fucking ruling the world economy. We are ruling it. There is nothing else out there happening that is half as exciting as what we are doing here. Make no mistake. J.P. Morgan Chase is up to their eyeballs in this shit. They're all over Ripple and, and all those little, little institutional-based coins. They're all up in our shit. Do not make the mistake of lulling yourself into the belief that, oh, we've got years. No, these assholes have been talking about private blockchains for the last fucking three years. I know, I've been reading the fucking articles here on the show off and on that these people have been planning for this shit. You know, you think that Lightning Network just popped up out of nowhere? Fuck no. They've had the thing in test nets for fucking years. Because the, their idea was they were, they were going to push us all into fucking forcing us to using SegWit transactions and using SegWit wallets. And then next thing you know, it would just transition off chain and you wouldn't even know it. Because your, your transactions are going through nice and cheap. and it, Oh, it's everything is so wonderful. You know, if, if, if everything had lined up the way they wanted it to, right? Where the miners just said, yeah, whatever, segue, okay. And, and put it in in like 2015 and like fully implemented it, right? And just nobody said anything, right? And the promises back then were that it was going to make transactions faster and cheaper, right? So assume for a moment they already had Lightning Network available. They just couldn't get enough of the transaction volume to be SegWit transactions in order to make it worth it. They have to make all of them into SegWit-based transactions so they can get them all onto the fucking Lightning Network and do the whole thing with that off-chain. You know? Just imagine that. And so that by now the transactions would be nice and cheap and nice and fast but they'd also be rising in cost by now see by now we would be back up to dollars paying dollars even with the lightning network and that's because they had legislation back as early as 2014 NYDFS's bit license you know I don't I don't know that they put it in back then I think they finished it off in 2015 point being that it has language in it pertaining to money transmitters and custodians and if you read the descriptions you will discover they are talking about a conceivable model for lightning okay people involving themselves in that they are talking about you you know and just because they're not getting hard on the on the hammer with actually trying to you know apply their will on that and do some enforcement doesn't mean they don't intend to. And and given the 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 language of the laws that I've been reading on here, the legislation that I've been reading on here, they intend to. <laughs> it's an intent, you know. It's palpable. Anyway, let's go ahead and drop back down into some music and uh, let's go for a little bit of prong. We haven't been playing any prong tonight, and I'm I'm missing it so. Let's go with Windows Shut here on Coin Metal. And that was Sixth with Weavers of Woe. I don't know. I, I discovered that band through uh, Pandora. For all my complaints to Pandora, I, I gotta say, they introduced me to some some really neat bands. I haven't been playing them as much on this show recently anyway. Um, but I really dig on uh, Within the Ruins. They they make some really fucking good music. And uh, I should play it more on this show actually. <clears throat> but anyway, I do have a few other little articles here that I'd like to cover today. <sighs> Yeah, I like that one. I may cover that one or not. I don't know. But, 
you know, with this uh, renewed interest in cryptocurrencies, you know, we go through waves where people forget about us and then people wish we didn't exist and then people are reminded that we're being kind of profitable versus fiat currencies and then all of a sudden they get interested and, and decide that they need to get in on it now. And, of course, as has happened, every single time we have had a major burst of, of new users, we experience service outages with people that, you know, we, we didn't have problems with before, you know, but they didn't actually prepare for the future, as none of us really have, or are really capable of doing. But anyway, try as they might, for they had these huge spikes in adoption, the, these huge spikes in interest in cryptocurrencies, because we are the new shiny, and you know they come in here in mass, and invariably a good number of them get burned. It, it just happens. A lot of you guys get soured on it. it. It happens. But what you have to do is you have to look at the mistake you made. You have to consider the the events that led up to that mistake happening. You know, what was it that drove you to make that decision that caused you to come into question with your former calls and, and you end up missing your marks because of that? What caused that? Was it a, a fear, you know, that you experienced because maybe you're micromanaging your account just a little too hard? You know, was it because you... Uh, you trusted in the word of somebody else who wasn't necessarily having your interests in their interests. You know, you gotta you gotta consider the event. What caused you to to get wrecked? <clears throat> and a lot of times, you're gonna find out that the ultim ultimately the thing that caused you to get wrecked was, is sitting somewhere behind the keyboard. But in front of the monitor in your chair. Yeah, that's right. You are the pet cack. And you you can't blame anybody but yourself. You can't blame Satoshi Nakamoto. You can't blame Bitfinex. You can't blame Tethers. You can't blame Ripple or, or Bitcoin or any other currency. It's you. You make decisions and things happen as a result. That's how it happens you know i accept the fact that i didn't make that much money this weekend by comparison to others because i was stupid and skittish and i reacted like a panicked little bitch well you know pff. okay i've learned my lesson i'm gonna dust myself off uh, pick myself back up again and, and and i'm gonna go back at it tomorrow i'm not gonna live and die by what happened I mean, uh, yeah, I haven't done that yet, so why is this going to be any different? It's not. And it shouldn't be. If it is, if you're internalizing your failures that hard, you really need to find another outlet. I don't care what it is, something you can be victorious at, preferably. You know, whether it be playing video games, which is fun, or going outside, getting some sunlight, getting a little perspective of what real life is because it's not sitting behind a computer monitor right it's just that's not real life that's it's part of real life you're living real life while you're doing it but it's not real life you know there's no i mean you're, you're having social interactions with people but not on the level that is really necessary for full communication to be taking place and you'll find this out as you start exposing yourself to people more that in those social situations when you're finding yourself feeling awkward it's because you're realizing you can't say all of the things you would really love to say if you were sitting behind a monitor and this person couldn't wrap their hands around your throat and strangle you it, it, you, you end up with glitches in your social game it's just that's how it is got it you got to get some air and and you know i i find it helps me to see the flow of nature you know I mean I'm a fisherman by nature I, everything I do is so I can facilitate better fishing trips that's that's pretty much it that's that's why I do what I do I, I do this show 
at its very root so that one day I can afford to go and fish places that I've never been able to fish before. That's a goal. I'm sorry. That's my value system. It's been that way since I was, shit, since I caught my first fish. You know, and I realized that I caught the fish. You know, I kind of tricked the little bugger into puckering up and eating it. But the, the point being that that's, that's just my value system. And you know, when I, when I look at things that I would like to invest in in the future, <clears throat> it's not nuclear reactors and it's not, it's not coal, coal mining or any of that other bullshit. You know, I, I live in a state that's got shit tons of running water on the surface of it. And, and that, that running water has pressure you know pounds and tons of pressure i mean it's going to go down the river anyway so why not try and harness a little bit of that energy and turn it into electricity i don't maybe i'm just a dreamer right <laughs> anyway uh i see this see these articles when uh whenever we have a big burst in value of cryptocurrency and it I, I have to entertain them because I know that I'm fortunate enough to be talking to somebody who's th this ex this right here is one of their initial exposures to cryptocurrencies and the people that are behind them and the people that have been involved in them and for that honor I you know I gotta I gotta try and honor that you know so it's with that that I, I try and introduce at least a little bit of entry level stuff because you know what none of us started off leap I mean even if you were coming from conventional markets into crypto you didn't start off leap there either you know somewhere along the line you got wrecked and you learned what failure looked like and started trying to find ways to mitigate it <laughs> and that's that's the basis for being a good investor and a good trader. So here we go. This one's on uh, fortune.com. Commentary. Three reasons why Bitcoin is worth so much right now. And the original source. Oh my gosh, we have somebody we can attribute this to. Five just day. Spencer Bogart. So clearly, we don't even need a picture. Penis. December 18th, 2017 was publishing date for this bad boy, so let's go. Bitcoin is a different kind of beast that can be difficult for people to understand. New things usually are. And while Bitcoin is nearly nine years old, it represents a completely new type of asset. Let's break down what I perceive to be three major components of Bitcoin's value. And I, I just want to take a, a brief moment and thanks Spencer very much for adhering, whether he knows it or not, to E prime principles in how he wrote this article. Very good. Payments, what people think of. As investors near the Bitcoin near the Bitcoin iceberg, the first thing they see is payments. After all, it's a cryptocurrency, right? Currencies are used for payments. And so Bitcoin must be all about payments. It's true. Bitcoin is certainly used for payments. And this is an important part of its value. However, it's not widely used for payments. And while it may be increasingly important over time, it isn't the most important component of Bitcoin's value today. Bullshit, Spencer. Bullshit. Continuing on. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Why people don't use Bitcoin for payments more often? Simply put, people don't like to spend appreciating assets. This is true. Given the choice of payment methods, people like to spend in the quote currency that is likely to be worth the least tomorrow. At this point, that's not Bitcoin. Furthermore, most people don't buy Bitcoin for payments. <clears throat> That's simply not why they acquired it. 
Even if you could, very few investors would pay for their coffee with Apple stock because it's simply not the reason they bought Apple stock in the first place. Same with Bitcoin. Lastly, people don't generally use Bitcoin for payments because goods aren't broadly priced in Bitcoin terms. Goods aren't broadly priced in Bitcoin terms because if they were, the price would have to update several times each minute just to maintain a consistent revenue for the seller. And that's not entirely true, Spencer. You can just be smart about how you, how you do your shit. In short, the major drawback of, to using Bitcoin for payments is that it is volatile, which is neither a great in ingredient for payments, medium of exchange, nor pricing of goods, unit of account. Actually, it is. It's an excellent one if you do something to it. And it's something very, very specific. And it's this. You have to decouple it from any association to a depreciating fiat currency. And, and I just want to take just a minor break on this just to address Spencer's point here. <clears throat> And I know it's kind of it's kind of unfair because he isn't really here. But point being <laughs> that with regard to this, you can value a a thing that you're selling, whether it be a a service or whatever, in a deterministically issued coin if and reliably you can do so, if you do yourself a major favor and decouple the any association with fiat currency. If you use the fiat currency as an intermediary for determining the value of your good or service versus Bitcoin, you will experience the volatility because the volatility is actually in the fiat currency side of the exchange rate. And this is something that most people do not understand about Bitcoin. Spencer may yet address this. I don't know. But the fact is that because the rate of issuance of U.S. dollars or, or any of, of these central cur central bank currency issued currencies, um, <clears throat> their, their books are not open to audit. So we do not know how many there are. Now, they can make statements about how fast they're issuing them and they can make statements about interest rates. But the difference between what they say and what actually happens is not apparent to us because we do not have an audit of the total volume of U.S. dollars, not in circulation, not in rate of issuance, nothing. We have to trust that the Federal Reserve is telling us the truth. We have to trust that the Federal Reserve is giving us their full books and saying, you know, stating everything explicitly, nothing is implicit, nothing is foggy language, the, the state of their books, but they don't. And as a matter of fact, they've been fighting this for the last 30 years. You know, uh, Congressman Ron Paul, he retired from being a congressman <laughs> without having fulfilled the goal of getting the Federal Reserve's books opened to Congress and the <laughs> the up uh, the downshot for for us is that we experience the inflation whether or not it's explicitly stated by the Federal Reserve is irrelevant we experience it we experience it in the cost of oil we experience it in the in the volume of, of products that we purchase both in in every aspect you know duration quality um, quantity all of these things are tweet qualities of the or traits of products and services that we purchase and they're always being gamed, regamed, gamed, regamed to match with the depreciating dollar. Because these people that provide these services and, and make these products, they have costs. And when they're buying stuff to make their products with, and it costs ever more amounts of U.S. dollars because the Federal Reserve is printing them off faster than toilet paper... 
they experience that and and that travels back up the line to you the end user and you experience a decline in quality a decline in quantity a you know duration a- anything you have to suffer the additional cost being burdened onto the manufacturer or service provider by your fiat currency that you're doing your transactions in and so in Bitcoin you can't hide this you cannot hide this when it costs you more for the electricity that you you spent mining last month this month you're going to ask for more for your fucking Bitcoin because you need to recover that cost you didn't do it out of charity your incentive is getting paid not like not like Lamborghini paid but fucking paid in proportion to your actual participation on the network or, or success rate thereof it, these are the incentive structures we don't need quote unquote additional governance to manage that business anyway I, I'm sorry I, I got way off here way off in the woods <clears throat> And so we'll continue on. In short, the major drawback to using Bitcoin for payments is that it is volatile, which is neither a great ingredient for payments, medium of exchange, nor the pricing of goods, units of account. Long term, however, I expect Bitcoin will be increasingly used for payments because as adoption grows, volatility declines and rapid appreciation diminishes. <laughs> Yes, unless, of course, you're valuating it in a depreciating currency. And then it just looks like it's, it's going rocket sauce on you. Continuing. Digital gold. Why people buy. While payments are the first thing that people think of for Bitcoin, the reason that most people buy today is its utility as, quote, digital gold. This is the center of buoyancy for the Bitcoin iceberg people are attracted to an asset that is provably scarce, nearly impossible to seize or censor, which is changing, or part of a decentralized and permissionless network that anyone can participate in. Yes, that's a, that's why a lot of us are involved, dude. You got that one right. As a venture firm dedicated to the blockchain and crypto ecosystem, we're constantly collecting data points from around the world. But one of my favorite anecdotes is a doctor in Brazil who has converted his medical practice one day a week into a, quote, Bitcoin consultancy, where all he does is help doctors and other people get set up with Bitcoin. The main reason they want to buy? They're terrified of wealth confiscation in light of a burgeoning public deficit. To be clear, they're not rushing to put all of their assets into Bitcoin, but it's a piece of a defensive strategy for some Brazilians to retain their hard-earned wealth. Programmable Asset – Why Bitcoin Will Attract Mass Appeal Lurking below the surface, the most underappreciated component of our Bitcoin iceberg is its value as a programmable asset. I don't agree with that, but okay. When we take something from the physical world and we make it entirely digital, natively digital, we shed many of the constraints of the physical world. Today, our legacy financial infrastructure is not natively digital. Companies like PayPal have done a tremendous job making it easier to use our outdated financial infrastructure in a digital age, but they didn't recreate the infrastructure itself. In contrast, blockchains are enabling new natively digital financial infrastructure in the form of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others. As a result, we can do new things. We have programmable assets for the first time. I'll give you two early examples within Bitcoin, multi-signature transactions and time-locked transactions. The former allows me to send Bitcoin to an address and specify that the value cannot be moved unless, say, two of three or three of five people agree 
or whatever parameters I set. Similarly, time launch transactions allow me to send Bitcoin to an address and specify that it can't be moved until some specific point in the future. Both of these examples are things I could hack onto legacy financial infrastructure. I could create a trust for example, but these things require hours of legal costs and logistics time. In Bitcoin, that cost and effort has been reduced to a few lines of code. There are two early examples of what I believe will eventually be dozens and then hundreds of unique capabilities. Most encouragingly, young developers are picking up these puzzle pieces and assembling, in novel way, uh, assembling them in novel ways that could fundamentally change the fabric of finance and the way we transact. Ultimately, Bitcoin's value as a programmable asset is the most viable path to adoption. People will adopt Bitcoin because it's the easiest or only way to complete tasks X, Y, and Z. This is software eating the world of financial assets for the first time. I don't know what this trend will lead to or the amazing things that will result. But I see a world of new opportunities over the next three to five years and couldn't be more excited about the quality of teams entering this space and the direction this industry is headed. And Spencer Bogart is a partner at Blockchain Capital. So he has an interest. Bogart is an investor of Bitcoin. Good man. Good man. Hodl. Hodl on, man. Hodl on. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think this is off on a couple points. Um, not many. But I, I really think that we're kind of at an impasse. And, and we've been here before with several other technologies where the the way to go is kind of uncertain. Whether we want to hand transaction processing off to third parties that we would probably not want to associate with in crypto if we had a choice. Um or if we want to continue to shoulder that burden. And you can tell from, from some of the little clues that we've been covering in this, in this episode here, the intent for the vast majority of the people out there, not, not their legislators and not, their, not their, their regulatory burden motherfuckers, not the, not, the, not the legacy investors and the legacy banks and all those guys, now, they're showing an intent to be maintaining these networks on their own. And now when you extend to that the willingness to maintain the internet or an internet, think about it this way. The road out in front of your house, what's its real value? I mean, it's just a bunch of asphalt, really. But what's its real value? It allows fast conveyance of products and people from point A to a million points out there. That's its utility. Now imagine that in the digital world where you and your neighbors and their friends and their neighbors and their friends and their neighbors establish your own infrastructure of internet infrastructure. I mean, there's plenty of white space out there. We could be occupying some of it for this purpose. And I, I would be amazed if somebody isn't doing it already. But this is the way out of this whole fucking net neutrality bullshit. I mean, we have all of the technology at our fucking fingertips. You probably... Take a, a Raspberry Pi and a and a, a few terabyte USB hard drives, and, and set up some sort of file server for in some sort of DNS server for your your uh, your local network and be hosting and shit. So you know there there's immense number of possibilities out there 
that can get us out of this current state that we're in, where the internet itself can be acting as a bottleneck inhibiting our future economic and social development. I, I, I don't see any way to justify that to myself in this age. I mean, literally, I've got enough technology laying around me right now. I know I do. To, to be able to cobble together some sort of like fucking internet broadcast tower and some sort of server that could be, you know, delivering packets to any one of my neighbors and they could be hooked into some other either line of sight or, or non-line of sight as I, I was reading a little bit on white space and they, they say line of sight isn't actually necessary for that business. Um, but the point being is it's all possible. We have the technology laying around us right now to just say, okay, Comcast, you want to exercise your position in the, in the whole fucking network topology and, and you want to abuse that market position and you want to lord over us a little bit more? No, no, no. If I can replace you with a couple solar panels and an old server and a couple terabyte fucking USB drives, you're gone. You're done, Ski. I will electrify that. It would be worth it to me to electrify that. If I could get the cost down to where, you know, I can handle whatever network traffic I'm experiencing over it and everybody else can, why wouldn't you do it? If, if for no other reason than getting the foot off of your neck, why wouldn't you do it? Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. We've uh, exterminated this thing, I think. I think we finished. Did we? Yeah, we did. Okay. I wanted to make sure that we'd actually uh, finish Spencer's article. Like I said, his thesis, it's, uh, there's some aspects of it I found sound, but uh, a couple of them I thought were a little off in the woods anyway let's go ahead and throw back down into some music for a moment and i was wanting to play some within the runes and so that seems that seems appropriate and so here it is elite here on coin metal and that was needles by system of a down you gotta love that <clears throat> pull the tapeworm out of your ass get the boot off your neck Kill that fucking bottleneck, man. Let's get some fucking throughput. It's my manufacturing ideology kicking out in me, man. It's like I I can't I can't look at the the fucking bottleneck and say, oh yeah, we can we, we can live with that. We we we'll just you know work around that. You know maybe maybe kick the can down the road a little bit. You know just kind of whatever. No, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do it. You know, I couldn't do it when I was working on a manufacturing floor. If if there was an alarm going off because there was a product a, a, a lot that had come up that was done, I, I couldn't leave it alone. I didn't give it a fu- I didn't give a fuck. It was in somebody's somebody else's area. I'd sign in as them. I don't care. I I'd I'd sign that lot along as them. I'd move it along to the next step because you know why. I wanted my throughput to go up. I didn't give a fuck about credit. No, 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 no. I want my department to do well. I want when they're looking at where to distribute the funds, they they see my department and, whoa, these guys really kicked ass this last month. We We gotta compensate them a little bit for that. That's what I go for. I don't, I don't care about my personal glory. That's good enough. You know, I feel good enough about having done well. That's enough for me. But, you know, some people, they, they need all the credit. You know, they need to be able to lord it over other people. And you know what? I just don't play that game. It's it's not my thing. Because it's more important to me that shit got done. It's more important to me that the work was actually completed was on time if not ahead of time because that's where I want to live right ahead of time I want to see it coming I want to know it's there 
I want to deal with it before it's even a fucking issue. I don't even want you to know about it. I want the fucking re- resolution to happen so fast that you as an end user, you're completely fucking unaware of it. It just, it, we took care of that shit. We hammered it down. We tacked it up. We got the lot moving along to the next department. And it was so fast that you didn't even have anything to complain about. That's what I want. That's what I expect out of cryptocurrencies. You know, one of the one of the virtues of cryptocurrencies is the lack of regulation. And and you gotta really put it into perspective. We have gotten here twenty thousand dollars of fucking Bitcoin without a single regulatory body telling Bitcoin how to be. It just was, we did it without permission, and here we are today. So the idea that we need a mommy or daddy to come in and restructure everything to where it's jimmied around so that they and their friends are the only people that profit off of this shit? (laughs) Fuck you. (laughs) This is our shit. You know, we're, we're more than happy to transact with you in it, but do something with the money that we give you that we actually want. You know, rather than building the next iteration or designing the next iteration of nuclear bomb to get from here to there that much faster, let's work on getting energy or or a data transmission from here to there that much faster. And when I say here to there, I'm not talking about here to your neighbor's house or here the east coast to the west coast. I'm talking about here to Mars because that's where we're supposed to be right now. We're not supposed to be dawdling around on this fucking mud ball right now. we got more than enough technology around us to enable that reality. Let's fucking get to work. And it is with that that I would like to close out this episode. And we will be back again on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, as usual. And so until then... I want you all to trade safe because motherfucker, it is volatile out there. I want you all to do your homework because this is the time when the scammers get the most active. When the hackers get most active is when you're fucking hodling coins live in a fucking account somewhere. So, do your motherfucking homework and watch out for your fucking bunghole because you know what? No matter how well-intentioned somebody says they are, No matter what promises they give you of security, the best hands are always your own. And there is nobody else out there that is going to do it as well and as consistently as you can. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. Hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, in the Telegram channel for Verge. I'm also in the IRC chat. I will do my best to get this and other episodes up on the YouTube channel ASAP for your listening pleasure. Thank you again for listening and you'll all have an excellent evening. I don't know what I'm going to put in for our last dance, so we're just going to scroll and click, see what happens. Here we go. Static X Cannibal here on Coin Metal. Good night.